So welcome back. Uh, so we uh, left off in the previous video talking about uh, the newer execution frameworks like Yarn, Taze, and Spark, and how they let you do more complex uh, uh, acyclic graph of tasks, and uh, you know use advanced features like uh, memory caching of data and things like that. So let's go a little bit in, more into detail. So what we're going to look at in this uh, 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 video is layout of some of these new frameworks. So we are uh, how they fit into the Hadoop environment, essentially. And some of the optimization strategies they've been using. Uh, uh, all of these frameworks are pretty complex. And you know, to go into for more detail, we're going to use some of the upcoming modules, especially for Spark. We have a, a separate module that goes into that. Uh, we look at a couple of examples in Taze and Spark to show how things get better by using these frameworks. So if you're looking at where this fits into the Hadoop framework, so you have HDFS uh, layer at the bottom, which is the storage layer, essentially. Uh, so on, sitting on top of that is YARN, which is uh, essentially the basic uh, execution engine in the next generation Hadoop. So there are some applications that fit uh, right on top of YARN. So HBase is an example. There are lots of other applications like that that just work through YARN uh, to let you do things. There are other applications like Pig and Hive that could uh, use the optimized newer engines like Taze that itself works through YARN. So you could uh, use applications there. And some of these applications have backends that work either with Taze or with Spark uh, going through YARN. Uh, either way, there are lots of options. Now, the good news is if you're an end user and you've gotten used to programming uh, with Hive, you don't really have to change anything because the backend implementation is the only thing that changes. As far as Hive is concerned, all the commands and everything look the same. Now, one other thing to uh, mention here uh, is uh, Spark actually can run without YARN if needed. It could run directly on HDFS. In fact, it can run on other forms of storage also. Uh, and Spark has uh, a rich application base that you, we will look into in future modules. So first, let's go to the basic YARN uh, setup. So it's, uh, it does support the classic uh, MapReduce uh, yeah, framework that uh, you're used to. So if applications have been written in that, like in a whole older Hadoop version, or you're comfortable with that, uh, they will work in YARN. Uh, but the nice thing is there's a rich source of applications on top of YARN, uh, like HBase, Giraffe, Storm, Impala, uh, that all work uh, through YARN. So if you're used to those applications, you don't have to change anything either. Of course, you can write your own uh, user developed application that uh, runs through YARN. Uh, you will have to write a client and a, a application master and all the managing of all the tasks and things like that, but you could develop an application in YARN. The other thing that uh, YARN enables is frameworks like Taze and Spark that sit on top of it. And they talk to YARN for the resource requirements, but uh, other than that, they have their own mechanisms of supporting uh, applications. So we'll start off with by looking at Taze. So the main uh, component there is essentially it can handle data flow graphs. Uh, there is an expressive API that's allow, that allows you to do this. And the entire framework is integrated with YARN, as I mentioned. Uh, what it lets you do is customize the application logic. So it doesn't necessarily need to fit the MapReduce framework. Uh, it uh, lets you customize data formats, so there's no restriction like a key value pair on a MapReduce uh, framework. And similarly with data transfer, there's some customization. So in the original MapReduce framework, if you had a complex uh, graph of tasks, you would end up with a bunch of MapReduce jobs that would essentially write to disk after each of those jobs, and you would end up maybe serialization of tasks in some cases, and there would be synchronization overheads. And with Taze, you can get around that, uh, and it could be reduced to one job. And we'll see an example in the next slide. So what this does is essentially gives you lots of resource uh, efficiency improvements. Uh, by A, not using uh, as much of it, like you're not doing as many H HDFS writes and using HDFS data because uh, you've simplified the job. Uh, but 
But also there are things like reusing resources where possible. So a lot of times when you have to spin up a container on Yarn, there is a, a, a time delay involved because it takes time to start up things. Uh, with this, you could have uh, essentially what are warm containers uh, that are, are uh, you could reuse containers where basically uh, you're not taking those costs of startup. And you can cache data in some cases. So all that makes things much faster. Now, as I uh, mentioned, uh, so this improves resource usage efficiency. But as I mentioned, uh, things like Pig and Hive already use these. So if you already use those tools, you're not changing anything. You're just changing the backend execution engine. That uh, is a very simple change, and, and then you get the performance benefits. So let's look at a simple high one days example. So we are just doing a select from uh, A and joining from a second table B based on the ID and then joining on C based on uh, item ID and then we are grouping uh, things. So if you had gone and written this in, uh, in the original Hive uh, MapReduce implementation, this would have turned into a bunch of MapReduce jobs. So you would have a job for the select A dot vendor, you would have a job for the join A uh, uh, and C and selecting the cost. And then you're basically uh, also uh, going to have another join uh, at the end where uh, you're taking the data from B and A and then joining. And then there's a selection uh, task uh, uh, from table B. So you can see this has ended up in a lot of MapReduce jobs that uh, also be writing to HDFS in all these intermediate steps. So you can see the inefficiencies. Now, if you write the same thing in Thais, uh, what you're going to end up with is uh, the intermediate map steps are gone. You're not writing to disk. You're reusing some of the uh, containers and data. So you can, uh, uh, and you have a, a simplified graph. So you end up with uh, a lot better performance. So this is one example of essentially how Thais works. And, uh, as I mentioned, there is, uh, these uh, uh, newer frameworks have a rich set of features and uh, lots of advantages of using them. Now, another example is uh, Spark. So this, again, is an advanced DAG execution engine. Uh, the nice thing uh, is it's very flexible. Uh, like a lot of the functions like mapping, filters, joins, and group buys, et cetera, are easy to handle. Uh, it can handle cyclic data flows, which is very important because if you have an iterative graph algorithm, like in machine learning cases or uh, stream processing, uh, it's going to be much more efficient, uh, unlike uh, other engines where you, you could do it, but it's going to be tedious and inefficient. You might have a lot of intermediate data spills. Now, Spark will also keep track of data produced uh, during operations. So this allows for storing uh, working data sets in memory. And it's pretty graceful with spilling over to disk if it runs out of memory. So data can be shared across DAGs, can be shared between iterations, and can be reused. And this makes it much faster than MapReduce or even some other DAG engines uh, because of the in-memory computing, essentially. The other nice thing with Spark is uh, it can be accessed, I mean, the functionality can be accessed from Java, Scala, Python, and R, and these are all high-level languages that a lot of people are used to. Uh, so you get the big data processing uh, advantages, but you can write things in high-level languages, and we'll see an example of this next. The other nice thing is there's a rich suite of existing uh, libraries that can handle things like graph analytics, machine learning, streaming applications, uh, all kinds of things that are data intensive, data processing, that are available that you could use in isolation or you can use them in combination. So it's very generalized, uh, which is very powerful, especially when you're writing in high level languages. So let's look at a simple example of a logistic regression. And uh, if you're not familiar with Python, that's okay. I'm just going to point out a few things in this example. So this example, as I mentioned, is written in Python. Uh, uh, all we are doing is uh, an iterative machine learning algorithm, which is going through the same data set of points uh, through a MapReduce process. And it's basically uh, trying to find an optimal uh, gradient. So what you're doing, uh, if you look at the code there, is uh, an iterative process which uh, 
uh, loops over several iterations and uh, has a map, same, similar map reduce process operating on the same set of data essentially. So uh, what this means is you could cache these uh, data points in uh, RAM across iterations and that would uh, essentially make things a lot faster. So as, uh, as you can see, there's the cache statement in the first line when we are loading the data and that keeps the data in RAM across uh, iterations. And then the other thing to see is see how easy it is to define mapping and reduce functions in these. These are uh, in red in this uh, slide. So uh, in a high level language, that, that's a lot easier to do. So we are looking at two things, essentially the in-memory computing and the uh, ease of uh, expressing your uh, data processing algorithm. So if you run this code, and this is a standard example from the Spark site, uh, this runs about 100x faster in Spark when compared to Hadoop. So there's a huge advantage in using memory. And as I mentioned, there will be a much longer Spark uh, uh, module coming up later in this class.